It's called the Mississippi. A little more than a century ago, she was wild and untamed and beautiful. Eventually, a new civilization would be born here, but before that could happen, the river would have to be tamed. But to tame a river as mighty as the Mississippi would take a miracle. That miracle came in a year full of miracles and mystery, a year when the stars were crossed and nature was out of joint. The year was 1811, and the miracle was a simple invention that would become an American tradition, the steamboat. Our story begins in the year of mystery and miracles, 1811. That was a year that began with mystery. A disastrous flood that inundated the entire Mississippi Valley. When the waters receded, swamps were left. Their dampness bred a plague of chills and fever. In the fall of that year, a comet blazed across the heavens, leaving a ghostly twilight in its wake. Now that had hardly faded when the first of the new Madrid earthquakes hit. It was at two in the morning on December the 16th. During the next three months, 1,850 shocks were felt all along the valley. Some say it was the worst quake ever to hit North America. Entire towns were engulfed by the river. Buildings simply disappeared into the ground. Coincidence? Or were they interrelated? That is still the great mystery of 1811. The miracle of that year came in the form of the first true Mississippi steamboat, the New Orleans. It was built by Robert Fulton in Pittsburgh. She had her maiden voyage in the fall of 1811, steaming down the Ohio and Mississippi rivers on a perilous journey towards her namesake city. That trip would change river travel forever. 
Gradually, steamboat designs would change. Tall flagpoles on the bow replaced sails, allowing the pilot to sight a course more easily. By trial and error, the early deep rounded hulls and masts of the New Orleans gave way to shallower hulls that literally rode on the water, not through it. By the 1850s, steamboat design reached its peak, and hundreds of them plied the Mississippi and her tributaries. On the lower Mississippi and Ohio rivers, most were side paddle wheelers. They were more maneuverable and faster than stern wheelers. Boats that traveled the upper Mississippi and twisting lengths of the Missouri were more often stern wheelers because they could run in much shallower waters. Eventually, they became so ornate that they were often referred to as floating palaces. As a rule, they had four decks. The main deck housed boilers, engines, firewood, freight, and the cheap fare passengers. Above it was the boiler deck. Now, oddly enough, no boilers were ever placed on this deck. Indeed not. It was reserved for the boat's finest cabins. Above that was the hurricane deck. And on top of that was the Texas deck, where the cruise cabins were located. Topping it all off was the pilot house, glassed in on all four sides, above which rose the twin smokestacks, typical of Mississippi riverboats. On the Mississippi, cotton was responsible for the tremendous success of the steamboat. For in the 1800s, cotton was definitely king in the South. It was the main crop and was exported to Europe for the manufacture of clothing. Because steamboats played the major role in moving that crop from plantations to New Orleans, they gave growers easy access to markets and, of course, money. Along with the invention of the cotton gin a few years earlier, the steamboat would now give the South a foundation on which to build its economy. Captains designed their steamers to carry the maximum amount of cotton that they could get aboard, often building wide guards that extended out from the hull as a platform to stack even more of the fleecy staple. During the season, Passengers were second-class cargo. Their cabins were transformed into dark caves as bales were heaped outside their windows to the very top deck. No wonder. Captains commanded a dollar a bale, and when you consider a boat might take on 8,000 bales in a single trip, it wouldn't take long to pay back the $150,000 investment in a vessel. The largest load of cotton ever recorded on a steamboat was carried by the Henry Frank in 1881. It arrived in New Orleans with 9,226 bales. At the height of the steamboat era, farmers and plantation owners would bring their cotton and other goods out to their landings and there were thousands of them all along the river, where the first steamer by would get the contract to carry the freight. It was from this competition to get goods to market the fastest that the tradition of steamboat racing began, as each captain would rush to get business from other boats on the river. The actual prize was simple enough, a pair of gilded deer antlers, the buckhorns placed over a boat's pilot house were the symbol of fleetness. 
and have become the traditional trophy of steamboat racing. But there was far more at stake when the Natchez and the Robert E. Lee decided to have it out in 1870. Thomas P. Leathers of the Natchez was a Southern fanatic who always dressed in Confederate gray. He was fiercely competitive and proud that he owned the fastest boat on the river. At the time, he held the golden antlers to prove it. His rival, John W. Cannon, was a fellow Kentuckian, but his sympathies were definitely with the North, and despite its name, the Robert E. Lee was considered a northern boat. Nobody knows which one issued the first challenge to race. Officially, there never was a challenge at all. The two men were not on speaking terms after a fist fight in a New Orleans bar. But this was a time of great competition on the river. And although racing had long been known as a daredevil sport in which the rivals risked blowing their boats to pieces in order to win, a challenge like this could not be ignored. The route was a familiar one. Both boats had made the trip many times before. It would be a go-as-you-please race, no rules. The first to steam from New Orleans up the Mississippi 1,200 miles to St. Louis would be the winner. So, on June the 30th, 1870, the unofficial race began. Rarely had the levee been so crowded as it was that afternoon. For more than a mile, steamboats lined the riverbank. Spectators milled along the water's edge, placing bets as to the outcome of the race. It would turn out to be the most famous steamboat race of all time. By Independence Day, 1870, three days, 18 hours, and 14 minutes later, the race was over. And the Robert E. Lee had made the trip in record time, a record that to this day has never been broken. Captain Leathers would have to surrender his buckhorns. As newspapers reported, millions of dollars were waged on that race as far away as Chicago and London and even Paris. This is where our journey begins, at the mouth of the great Mississippi Delta, New Orleans, Louisiana. New Orleans has always had an affection for the steamboat. This is where the last two overnight steamers left on American rivers are preparing to embark on a journey into history. Captain John Davitt of the Delta Queen and Captain Lawrence Keaton of the Mississippi Queen are preparing to steam up the Mississippi and retrace the route of the great steamboat race. Okay. Good luck to you. Okay. But unlike the Natchez and the Robert E. Lee, their race will not be about speed. No. It will take them 12 days to get to St. Louis. Their race is about capturing the spirit of the great steamboating era, as these vestiges of bygone days take their charges upriver and into history. This is the legendary Delta Queen. She was once the Grand Lady of Western Rivers, but for three decades now, she has been steaming the Mississippi. 
She's approaching 70 and carries her golden antlers over her pilot house to prove she's currently the fastest on the river. Her captain, John Davitt, is a New York native who graduated the Merchant Marine Academy and cut his teeth on ocean vessels before coming to the river. I came aboard the Mississippi Queen on a relief job as mate just for two weeks, and I loved it. I got on to St. Louis, Missouri and sailed down to New Orleans. I'd never seen anything like the Mississippi River. Originally being from Massapequa, Long Island, um, you didn't hear a lot about towboats, and it was like a step back in time for me. And to see the river itself, I, I decided to stay at that point and was hired permanently and worked my way up from second mate, first mate, chief mate, steersman, pilot, now captain. He will be defending her title against the mighty Mississippi Queen, billed as the largest steamboat ever built. She rises seven decks tall and weighs over 3,300 tons. Size and youth and brute strength are in her favor. Her captain, Lawrence Keaton, has been on the river a half a century and says he's loved river boats for as long as he can remember. I grew up on the river, much as you might say Mark Twain did, Samuel Clemens. I live right up the hill up here in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, from where the boats came in. And so as kids, we played at the river. I learned swimming the river. And a lot of people in my neighborhood worked on the river. And it was, uh, for those times, the early 30s, it was just, we just naturally uh, went to the river. And that's where most of the kids in my neighborhood went to work, was on boats. His passengers are betting that Captain Keaton's 50 years experience will help the Mississippi Queen recapture the buckhorns she once held. One hundred and thirty-five river miles from New Orleans, the boat steamed toward the capital of the state of Louisiana, Baton Rouge. During the great race in 1870, the Lee passed here a mere eight hours, 25 minutes out of New Orleans. The Natchez followed her by about three minutes. Baton Rouge is where the character of the river changes. It's a deep water port. 325 miles from the sea and as far upriver as ocean-going vessels can go. This is plantation country, where many of the early planters decided to build their impressive antebellum homes. Many of them were built within the sight of the river. San Francisco, Oak Alley, Destrahan, and this one, not away. This is the largest plantation home in the South. Like the plantation homes that lined the river, the great steamboats each had their own personality. And passengers were fiercely loyal to the boat that they liked best. The same is true of the two remaining boats on the river. Fans of the Delta Queen are usually a more conservative crowd. At only 285 feet, 2,550 tons, she carries 176 passengers and a crew of 80.
Her 19-foot paddle wheel pushes her along at a leisurely seven miles an hour. Of those who travel aboard her, she is considered a classic riverboat. The Mississippi Queen is anything but classic. 50 years younger, almost 100 feet longer, 1,000 tons heavier, and more than 20 feet taller. She boasts luxury staterooms, a swimming pool, a sauna, a movie theater, a beauty salon, and two show lounges. 2,000 horsepower turn her 36-foot paddle wheel at an average speed of eight miles per hour. Natchez, Mississippi, 364 river miles from New Orleans. And the queens are tied together beneath the bluffs overlooking the river. During the great race in 1870, the Lee was still in the lead as she steamed upriver here, a slap in the face for Captain Leathers, who not only named his boat for the town, but lived in this house right here on the main street. Natchez is the oldest site on the Mississippi. It dates back to 1700, when there was a military fort here designed to keep the British from moving west. Today, the first of several good-hearted competitions between the passengers and the crew will take place, the annual Lucy Parade. This is an appropriate site for such a parade because it was here in a section of town called Natchez Under the Hill where tough rivermen, gamblers, and loose ladies used to gather in the red light district. Today, the contestants create their own impressions of those 19th century scarlet ladies and their business managers. It doesn't look much different today than it did back in the 1800s, when Natchez was the first incorporated town, and then the capital of Mississippi. At that time, Cotton had made her one of the richest towns along the river. By the advent of the steamboat, she was also one of the busiest. It was on a steamboat during the same year as the great race that a 20-year-old by the name of Henry C. Norman first arrived in town. He was a photographer who would come to settle here, and before his death, would take some 75,000 photographs of the town and the steamboats that called here. This massive visual record has been inherited by Dr. Thomas Gandhi, who has published several books containing Norman's amazing work. Those photographs speak for themselves about the luxurious means of travel steamboats represented. Well, if, if it was during the cotton shipping season, it wasn't so hot. The cotton bales, for example, were stacked high on the decks and uh, passengers were sort of pushed aside. Uh, but other than the cotton season, there was a very luxurious uh, travel. They had all sorts of liquors, anything that you wanted. And the furnishings were, in the bigger boats, uh, the furnishings were uh, gorgeous. They, they had imported uh, Brussels carpets. They had fine silver. They, the chairs and, and were all made out of fine woods. In the glory days of the steamboat, each had its own silver water cooler in the main lounge. 
a must aboard rivercraft during the stifling summer months. And judging from the number of waiters in this dining room, service was indeed unparalleled. That's the way it was on bigger boats. But not all steamers were first class back then, and not all passengers were treated the same. You could book passage on a steamboat for as low as deck passage. For 50 cents, you got a spot on the deck, but you had to bring your own bedroll and your own food. Even if you were wealthy, you had no bathrooms on board, and had to use the chamber pot in your room. Cultured men used spittoons, which were plentiful. Boats were segregated as well. There was a ladies' lounge where no man was welcome, unless all the ladies on board took a vote and agreed to let him in. And the men had their own smoking lounge where no lady ever dared enter. Some steamboat captains would not allow gambling or gamblers aboard their vessels, while others felt that the highest class boat had the best gamblers. They were always looking for those shiny men with their canes and golden watches to show off on their steamboat. Steamboats were at the time the epitome of luxurious travel in an era when time mattered less than the style in which you got there. The same is true today. As the Mississippi and the Delta Queen steam north once again past the high bluffs and the antebellum homes of Natchez. By morning, they would be in Vicksburg. Vicksburg, Mississippi. Known by historians as the Gibraltar of the Confederacy. It was a thriving and wealthy town when the Civil War broke out. It was from here that the South controlled the Mississippi and the valuable states to the west. So many people uh, at this day, and we feel that they don't realize exactly what was at stake during the Civil War. It was not just a, uh, a fight to free the slaves or states' rights, but it was a combination of all these things. And all these things made the uh, conflict so great. And adding on top of that, the fight of brother against brother, has really made it a very, very sad part of our nation's history. This is where you'll find one of the best preserved remains of a Civil War steamboat, the Union gunboat USS Cairo. At one corner of Vicksburg's military park, scientists have reassembled the Union ironclad, just as she was found after being buried in the mud for over a hundred years. This is a unique look at the workings of an actual 19th century steamboat. She remains one of the most complete relics of the great age of steamboats.
Perhaps no musical instrument is associated with a steamboat more closely than the American steam piano, better known as the Calliope. Its unique music signaled a boat's arrival in the early days. Hardly ever does a boat leave town today without its calliope blaring. Historian Gordon Cotton says, there's been a love-hate relationship with the calliope since the instrument was first invented. When the first calliope came into Vicksburg on a boat called the Amazon, I believe in the 1850s, uh, the editor of the Whig here, the newspaper, Marmaduke Shannon, editor Shannon commented something to the effect that it was a gosh awful screech. <laughs> well, it may be a gosh, gosh awful screech, but it, it's, it's music to our ears. It still gives us, oh gosh, we know that the river's still flowing and folks are still coming and having a good time. And there is still a thrill. I don't know what it is, but there's a thrill about hearing the calliope. As off key as it is, there's a thrill about hearing the calliope and knowing that they're down there and there's a lot of hustle and bustle on the waterfront. It's a rather flamboyant fate for an instrument that was first designed to replace church bells. In 1855, a Vermont farmer by the name of Joshua Stoddard patented the first calliope. But his use for the steam piano just didn't catch on. And no wonder. Its piercing sounds just seem more suited to the river than they do to a churchyard. But to the people who live on the river, the calliope sounds are as much a part of life as car horns and sirens are to those of us who live in the city. It won't take you long out here on the river to discover that life is a little slower. The scenery, prettier. And the river, normally very serene. It looks pretty much like it might have a hundred years ago. However, on the bridge, running the river has changed quite a bit. Those huge nautical steering wheels we're used to seeing in the movies have been replaced by these two silver handles with bicycle grips on the end. Adrian Hargrove is Captain Keaton's pilot. Well, I think one thing, uh, you know, we talk about Mark Twain, uh, and he was a great writer, no question about that. I think if Mark Twain was living today, he would find it altogether different situations. You know, back then, they didn't have bridges. They didn't have locks. And uh, today, we do have locks, we have bridges, and we have lots of traffic, lots of traffic. Especially from Baton Rouge down to New Orleans, if he, could, if, he, if he were here today and to see the traffic, he would probably want to go back to his resting place. A quick reading of Mark Twain will tell you how important a steamboat pilot is out here. Twain himself was a pilot before pursuing his career as a writer. The captain may be the master of his vessel, but it is the pilot who must actually steer the boat safely from landing to landing. No easy task back when the river was forever changing and there were few navigational aids. By now, during the great race in 1870, Captain Cannon was running more than one hour ahead of Captain Leathers aboard the Natchez. And rarely now did he see the smoke from her fluted stacks behind him. One thing that hasn't changed over the years is the excitement that a steamboat generates when it comes to town. We're now 750 miles upriver from New Orleans as the Queens call on Carothersville, Missouri, 
a small river town that began as a fur trading outpost in 1794. All these towns up and down the river, I think they too think about the old past and what their towns were like. If you look at some of the old pictures, New Orleans, Pittsburgh, there were literally thousands of steamboats out here that the people came down to visit as a dock. Uh, there are places on the upper Mississippi River with the locks. We'll pull into a lock at 3 in the morning and there will be hundreds of people out there cheering the boat. So they love what we are and they love, you know, looking back in the past. Here, and in many places just like it along the river, life is simpler. The pace is slower, and these giant steam-driven boats must seem even more wonderful. Captain John Davitt talks about the legendary Delta Queen. Well, you're sitting right here in a pilot house that's like the one Mark Twain sat in, barring radar and depth sounders, everything else is the same. You can see the great visibility we have out over the river, all of our controls, the old telegraph controls to the engineer. We even have a sound speaking tube over there where we can yell down to the engineer and tell him what we want. Um, beyond that, we have all the modern equipment also, radar, swing meter, depth sounder, radios. Um, this one is really a beauty. It's like a step back in time in this pile house. Once you're in the lead and out of this floor down, you can come around up on the two What's the side of it, okay? In the Delta Queen's engine room, the technology is definitely 19th century. Despite its Rube Goldberg appearance, a steamer's engine is extremely simple and relatively quiet. Hers is a horizontal cross compound steam engine with two cylinders. The high pressure cylinder on the starboard side of the boat has valves at each end which push and pull the steel arm that turns the paddle wheel. Once the steam is used in the high pressure side, it is pumped across to the low pressure cylinder on the port side of the boat, where it is used again to push and pull the port side arm. Her engines were built in San Francisco in 1925. The Queen herself was fabricated in Scotland a year later and then shipped to America where she was assembled in Stockton, California. She sailed the Sacramento River until she was brought east to the Mississippi River in 1947 where it is said she became haunted by a ghost, the ghost of Mary Green. Mary Green had the distinction of being one of the first women to ever captain a steamboat. She was an amazing person for her time, who with her husband Gordon ran a successful steamboat line that carried their name. By 1947, they had bought the Delta Queen. And although Mary Green was nearing her 80s and retired, she lived aboard the boat in her very own cabin, where she died peacefully in the late 1940s. Since that time, many people have said they've seen the ghost of Mary Green aboard the boat. Almost always after midnight, when the passengers have all gone to bed. Experts have come aboard to test for ghosts, and they confirm that there is a presence on board. It usually appears near the cabin in which Mary Green died. It normally appears as a woman wrapped in a cloak. Most of the time she's seen standing in a doorway or down a hallway. Of course, nobody knows for sure who it is. 
But the experts agree that the spirit is definitely there. And if it is Mary Green, they feel that she is perhaps trying to find out where she is and why. Is the ghost of Mary Green real? Or is this just another tall tale of the river? If you spend the night aboard her and roam her halls when the other passengers have gone to bed, you may just find out for yourself. Cape Girardeau, Missouri, 939 miles from New Orleans. During the great race of 1870, fog slowed the contestants to a mere crawl as they steamed north into this reach of the river. But no fog would obscure the river this day as the Mississippi Queen hurries to catch up with her older rival. 100 miles from St. Louis, the Queens steam past America's smallest national park, Tower Rock. Here, the river changes once again. It gets narrower, and the current runs faster, and its bends get much sharper. Seasoned rivermen will tell you that this part of the river is notorious for the number of steamboats that have gone down here. No wonder they call this the graveyard of the Mississippi. For all their splendor, their utility, and their romance, 19th century steamboats were quite dangerous. Historian Tom Gandy. Uh, for one thing, the early steamboats, uh, the metal uh, that, uh, that went into the construction of boilers, the metal was not very good. And um, it didn't, you know, they didn't withstand um, too much pressure. So they would explode. The uh, boilers, incidentally, were located in the forward part of the boat. The machinery, the paddle wheel and the pistons and everything toward the back of the boat. In the 19th century, when they blew up, of course, it was the forward part of the boat that blew up. So the rooms were cheaper there. The more expensive rooms were back in, toward the back. That was what I've always called one of the earliest forms of life insurance, was pay more to get a safer room. Fires were very common. The boats were built of wood. Of cotton was very flammable. The, the live sparks would come out of the smokestacks. They were burning uh, wood very often. And the boats would be loaded with cotton. And it would only take a spark or two. And the, the famous J. M. White, for example, in 1886 was tied up at Barcera, Louisiana, south of here, one night, and loaded with cotton. Some sparks caught the cotton on fire, and the boat was in full flames within 15 minutes. They were that flammable. They would also hit submerged tree trunks that would rip a wooden hull apart. A fast current could smash a boat into a bridge or onto another boat, while still others were crushed by ice flows. Some, uh, some boats were so heavily loaded with freight they would actually burst their seams and water would get in and they'd sink. Uh, the T.P. Lathers was one such boat. It was loaded with cotton. The boat, uh, the wreck, uh, 
you, you see the boat down in the water and the cotton floating off the deck, and yet that boat was back in service a month later. The salvage of these boats was, I think, more uh, amazing to me than the sinking of them. I, I don't see how they could do this. This was in the 19th century that they were raising these boats and getting them back into circulation. Records indicate that one boat's engines were used on a succession of steamers for over 75 years. They almost had to be, because boats were so expensive and their life expectancy was less than five years. July the 4th dawned clear and bright and St. Louis lay just over the horizon as the Delta and the Mississippi Queens steamed toward the start of their speed race. Like in the great race of 1870, the winner will be deemed the fastest boat on the river. This rare historic film of another race at another time can only hint at what it must have been like on that Independence Day in 1870. 75,000 people lined the riverbank into St. Louis to get a glimpse of the Lee as she headed toward the finish line. People even charted steamboats to get the best view of the Lee as she captured the golden antlers. It was the largest public turnout in St. Louis's history. It is now official, 11 days, 14 hours, 30 minutes, and a thousand memories from New Orleans. Our journey is over. And so is the great era of the American steamboat. It came and went in a brief blaze of glory, much like the comet did in 1811, that signaled the birth of that first steamboat. No longer are there hundreds of steamers traveling past an unspoiled wilderness, calling at quiet river towns, carrying cotton to busy port cities. No more does a steamboat symbolize the height of American imagination, invention, and ingenuity. Its era has passed. But the steamboat still survives in aging filmed images captured more than a century ago and aboard the Queens today. It is still possible to glimpse that era now long gone and reflect on those adventurers who travel the river long before we did. The steamboat has become one of our great American traditions, a tradition that really sets us apart from any other people on Earth. I'm Loretta Young, and we hope that you have enjoyed this look at an American tradition.